Well, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you all for your attendance today. Um, and so today I will discuss uh, some of the work that I've been uh, doing both here uh, in the Sackley area and from Stanford historically on trying to understand complex heritage materials. Um, so particularly when I'm back home in the United States, um, I'm often asked, well, what are you studying in cultural heritage and what is that, that exactly and why are you studying that? And I will say it's you know, in the light of the last two days, having the uh, day, patrimony days here in France, it's been very nice to not have to constantly explain to people in France why I'm studying cultural heritage. Um, but in general, um, we're looking at uh, different artifacts and objects that have, have a particular history of interest. And the research that we're doing is, a, as it was alluded earlier, is a very multidisciplinary uh, combination. So it involves the scientists who are maybe bringing in a particular technique uh, that has to answer a question that a uh, conservator or a museum um, might have to ask about that object. And it also has to involve the curators that are the people who have to actually make sure those objects stay safe. Um, so it's more than just uh, breaking apart uh, samples in the laboratory or making synthetic samples. It's a long process of trying to bring all the people together to have a collaboration to ask specific questions and figure out ways of answering them. And we want to understand all the kind types of things about the, uh, these types of objects, their properties, uh, perhaps how they were constructed, the processes that, are, that, are, that were used in that, and the preservation of these objects. So what happens when they're either stored away or put in a museum with time, light, the different environmental factors? Are there chemical processes that can go on? And these, do these provide visual or mechanical changes that we can uh, look at and try to understand all these processes that happen over time? And it's also, again, as we were alluding to in the introduction, it's a very uh, multi-scale problem. We have things that go through a very complex assemblage of materials. Uh, for instance, in a painting, you have everything from the support uh, to ground layers, to paint layers, to organic varnish, varnishes and glazes, and they may all interact at some point together. And we have the uh, scale problems. We, go, we might go from an entire painting to layers of paint to individual paint pigments and organic interactions. So we, in order to understand the properties that we see on the macro scale, we often need to go down to the micro scale to look at those uh, initial interactions. And we need to apply a diverse uh, toolkit to be able to characterize these, these uh, materials and their material research properties to reach a greater understanding of the process that's going on. Um, now, again, being at, uh, back home in the United States at the national laboratories, I'm often uh, asked again, what does this have to do with the Department of Energy, which is our main uh, funding source? Um, but you can actually really learn a lot from the, the past in this case. So a lot of these are two uh, sets of, re of uh, studies that, that have just come out in the last year even, uh, showing how Egyptian blue pigments uh, actually have a very in intriguing radi radiative pr uh, transfer property that can actually be used to diffuse infrared radiation and out, uh, back out. So by using the uh, Egyptian blue pigments and a roofing material, you could actually build a green cool roof that will actually cool itself. Um, and because you don't want, maybe designers don't always like white roofs, you can mix it with a little bit of orange pigment and still have a nice pretty black or green roof that will disperse most of the heat that it absorbs. Uh, and the same thing, uh, some of the polysulfide pigments that I'll talk about later interact very similar uh, with x-rays um, as do lithium sulfur batteries, which are the next generation of uh, high capacity batteries. And so the same techniques that we're using to study um, these pigments with x-rays are directly transferable to how we can study the, these batteries. So there's a lot that we can learn uh, from the ancient world that can help us learn about the modern world as well. Um, so my uh, research directions here kind of follow three main thrusts, and I think uh, I'll touch on a little bit of all of these uh, in my talk today. Uh, the mechanisms of damage in historical pigments, in, in particular radiation damage, as Luke was mentioning. And then trying to develop both uh, imaging tools and data analysis techniques that are, can actually help us um, determine these chemical properties uh, without, without damage or minimal damage. And trying to uh, establish uh, effective, effective tools to monitor and prevent this from happening, any damage in the first place. I'm going to start uh, by briefly kind of uh, giving you an overview of some of the cultural heritage studies we've done and kind of work our way um, by talking about different pigments in several different cases uh, uh, through our research here. 
Um, so briefly first, uh, we're using synchrotron facilities to do uh, very bright x-ray research. Uh, there's uh, Stanford on the left, uh, Soleil on the right. Um, these are critical to a lot of our research tools. Um, I always am asked, why, why do you use a large particle accelerator to do your research? And so my answer is like, well, it's very cool. And the main reason is that it's over a million times brighter than your conventional x-ray sources that you may use in your laboratories. Um, in addition to have being extremely bright, that allows us to do uh, very small focal beams and to get that better spatial resolution. It's also a tunable source, so it produces X-ray energies and, fo and the wavelengths over a wide band, and we can use that to tune in to the exper a particular experiment that we want to do. Um, you can go high energy to get transparent through, the beam, through, through a sample or right into the uh, absorption edge of an element of interest. Uh, and we generally also say that these techniques are non-destructive. That's always the general statement that we always put out there, but we'll discuss about uh, how they can be not always non-destructive too, and how we need to be very careful about these measurements. Um, so generally our categories of what I've been working on fall into X-ray fluorescence imaging. Um, so as we excite an atom, it will fluoresce a characteristic wavelength, a characteristic energy that will be more or less deterministic for deterministic for a particular element. So we might have a spectrum here that has energy or wavelength and intensity, and we can capture the amount of chlorine, phosphorus, calcium, iron, zinc, et cetera, in these different peaks, and get a snapshot of the concentrations of a particular element that are in the volume of the beam that's being excited. Um, and in action here, we might have a X-ray beam, and because you can't really move the X-ray beam or steer that very well, like you might in an in SEM or electron beam, you have to move the sample back and forth. Uh, so this is a graphic that uh, we put together showing you a sample. Um, in this case, it's a um, fossil sample being rashed across an X-ray beam. And as you hit different parts of the samples, you get different fluorescent X-rays coming off, and we can make a picture with that um, bit. Um, this is kind of like a dot matrix printer. I know that kind of ages myself that I'm familiar with this, uh, but forming line by line with the different colors of each element that of interest there. Um, the other uh, big tool in our toolbox here is X-ray spectroscopy. Um, there's lots of aspects of X-ray spectroscopy that we could get into, um, but in particular here, we're gonna be looking at the near edge region. So as we go through the edge, we see a change in the absorption characteristics due to, that, due to, the, due to the atom being present. And we can, the shapes of these curves are very uh, distinguishable for the different types of chemical species that are present. So this is showing iron in, in this case, but you can see the diff difference between oxides, sulfides, uh, carbonates, clay minerals. Um, it may often be hard to distinguish this between different oxides in the edge region, but you can go into the extended region and tell those apart. But we can use, really use this as a very important fingerprinting technique to figure out what's present in a sample and what the chemistry of a particular element is. And it's very nice because you're not um, worried about all the other uh, parts of the sample that are present. So we can just look in at one particular element, <coughs> focusing on that. Okay, so first I wanna start with uh, some work we've done on historical pigments. And in this case, it really means prehistorical pigments. Um, so this is, these are about 160 million years old. And this is uh, um, a very famous uh, specimen, Archaeopteryx. And we had the opportunity to, uh, to try to look at these uh, samples here. Um, and so the big question we have here is like when, you go, when you go to say the museum and you see fossils there, you usually are used to seeing it's at a limestone bed with some impression of fossils. Maybe you see a giant T-Rex with all its bones in there. Um, but we're dominated by studying paleontology by looking at the structures that we can see with our eyes. And are there things in these fossils, say organic material, soft tissues, that can still be preserved in a well-preserved specimen that can last for 100 million years? And we're not just talking DNA in the Jurassic Park kind of weird way, but we're talking about information about the coloration potentially and the organs and the soft tissues themselves. And can these chemical fossils, these trace chemical fossils, tell us more about either the environment that the dinosaur lived in, the chemistry of, of 100 million years ago, what they ate, um, what they had in terms of their tissue and blood? And can we also learn things about the fossiliza fossil fossilization process? How do, how, how do these uh, tissues become well-preserved? And if we do have these chemical fossils, what can it tell us bit maybe about um, pigmentation and coloration? And when it comes to coloration of animals, um, both 
complex animals and simple animals, the most common pigment is melanin. And these occur in tiny granules or melanosomes. And the really exciting thing about mel melanosomes is that they ac exist across all types of life uh, currently. So from bacteria to worms to squids to squirrels to birds, um, people, my freckles are all melanin based as well. And so because it's across all forms of life in both bacteria and um, um, more complex forms, it, this process of forming uh, melanin has a rich history that goes way back into the uh, timeline of where life formed. So it's a very uh, old biosynthetic pathway. Um, and it provides more than just coloration. So you can get all types of colors from melanin, from browns to blacks to reds. And it also provides strength in a lot of materials as well. So the reason why a lot of uh, birds that dive in the water have black feathers is always believed to be that it provides a strengthening factor to allow them to have to do speed dives into the water. Um, so it's an important thing to actually be able to study both how, the, how that pathway is developed through life and what it might mean if we see it um, in the past. Let's see, there we go. Um, and of course, without, you know, that's about blacks and, and dark browns. Um, so people always go, well, what about uh, those brighter colors that are structural based? So even a peacock, um, which obviously is not just black, um, but it also needs uh, pigments to actually make it colorful because while you're looking at the um, refraction of light to create all these um, um, bright colors, if you have a peacock that has no melanin, it looks white, even though it has the same structures. because <coughs> All that light is being scattered, not being absorbed, so you can't actually see the pretty blues and greens anymore. You just get the broad spectrum. And so even for a structural type of color, uh, the presence of pigments are, are very important to understand. Um, so I'm going to talk about two uh, different dinosaurs or birds that we've looked at. Uh, Archaeopteryx uh, from about 150 million years ago. This is kind of the more typical uh, transition from a dinosaur into a bird. Um, had sharp teeth, uh, bony tail still, so it has a lot of those characteristics that you think of a dinosaur. Um, and then this, the other one is a specimen that has come from Asia, the Confucius Ornus Sanctus. I finally said that right. Um, this is one that's about 120 million years old. And it's more bird than dinosaur. So you no longer have the bony tail, um, no, no more teeth in its mouth, but it still has uh, claws at the top of its wing. So it's not fully on the way to being a bird, but it's in that uh, um, progression. Um, the Archaeopteryx was one of the first things that we uh, looked at in terms of uh, ancient birds. And so here's the specimen. And when we get x-ray images of that in a broad scale, we can see there's presence of manganese. Um, and you can, if you look carefully here, you see that this is um, um, different grains of pyrolusite that have been extruded from the uh, bones themselves. You see there's uh, copper and zinc, um, again, present in the bones along with uh, major elements like calcium. And that shows the dietary uh, uh, need of these trace elements for the bird. Um, and one of the interesting things, of course, you also see is the artifacts that have happened when a specimen is, is not always handled correctly. Um, there's a large presence of bromine in the, uh, in the leg bone right here. And if you look back in the historical uh, records of the specimen, uh, it actually broke its leg at some point in its history. And the museum curators didn't want to show a dinosaur that had a broken leg on it, so they got some epoxy out and filled in some glue to make it look pretty again. And we can see that in the x-ray image. So we can see where they've done um, ways to make it look beautiful again and restorations. Uh, you can also see that uh, when the, uh, at some point in its life, it was handled without gloves. And so the museum curators at one point picked it up and carried the slab around the museum. And you can see the chlorine from their hands uh, has, has rubbed off on the side there. And so a lot, in a lot of ways where you're always looking for a well-preserved sample, you also need to make sure it's been done pristinely. Because uh, you can also often be looking at artifacts the entire time as well. And we don't want that to happen. Um, but the really interesting part with this is actually looking at these feather remains. And so if you squint uh, very carefully here in the, uh, cal in the calcium here, you can see these little streaks on the side here. If we uh, zoom in and pull up this uh, phosphorus map, you can see that there's small little traces of uh, feathers both on the left and the right side there. And so that these are actually not, not just impressions anymore, but actually the chemical deposition, de chemical deposition. There's no ridges, no morphology here, but it's just the chemical traces that have been left. Um, 
we couldn't see too much more in terms of pigmentation in this particular specimen, but it led us to really think about, okay, this is a great uh, case where we can actually find some tissues that aren't just bone left behind. Let's find better preserved samples and find, uh, see if we can actually find traces of these types of uh, um, pigments. Um, so the Confucius Ornus Sanctus was the, uh, our prime specimen for this here. Um, and so here it is in optical image, and you can see there's still the bones, you can see its head, beak, uh, tail feathers and such as impressions again in the fossil. These are now much uh, e more easier, easier to see visually. And you see things like the bones are present, again, in calcium. You still see a little bit of zinc present. Uh, you see iron present in the matrix. It's a sandstone, so it has a lot of iron cements in there. Uh, but the really interesting part that we didn't see before was this halo of copper in these uh, dark tail feathers here. Um, everywhere that we saw these dark pigmented feathers, we see these uh, uh, remnants of copper in the, in the sample as well. Um, and this is actually very exciting because you see copper in a lot of cases where you have melanin. So if you look at other fossils, so this is a uh, feather from a grebe, um, grebe-like uh, bird. Um, it has uh, copper uh, present here in red in these same areas that are dark. Uh, fish have a lot, lots of melanin in their eyes as a pigment. And so we see that in fossilized fish, we see uh, melanin as well, or there's, there's copper here. Uh, probably the best case of uh, animal melanin is in a squid sack, squid ink, and you can see that here, uh, a lot of, lots of copper in that. And even in modern day feathers like eagles and blue jays, you can see uh, melanin present. Um, and so if you zoom in on these feathers, we see a very spotty uh, detail at higher resolution, so it looks more like, like those melanosomes that we mentioned earlier. And if we look at the spectroscopy to actually see what the form of the copper is in there, it really does match these squid inks, feathers, all these types here really match natural copper melanin spectra and not something like copper oxide, copper carbonates, or other forms of copper that we might expect in a rock. And so our spectroscopy shows a consistent agreement with this being uh, copper that's being trapped in a melanin. And what this means is that you can then try to come up with an artist's impression. Um, and you can see where there at least was shading or color, so both in its uh, downy feathers around its head, shoulders, and, and tail there. And this is maybe a little bit pre before the, all the flight feathers have melanin in it, so maybe we might argue something about the flight function of these feathers versus diving versus gliding. Um, but I'll leave that for the paleontologist to debate. Um, but this is, this, these are first specimens really brought up a whole field of making cyclotron and pale paleontology you know, a very important uh, measurement to make. So we've done the things from frogs, um, um, million-year-old uh, rats, uh, looking at uh, squid and octopi, to looking at sulfur in organic leaves and be able to see these traces of organic sulfur that have persisted over millions of years and even looking at sulfur in corals to look at uh, the, what the chemical speciation of sulfur is in paleo proxies to, to better uh, interpret what we see in isotope measurements. And so kind of a nice uh, link between synchrotrons and isotope labs. Um, I'll now move on to what, what, what I'll call missing pigments. So how can we actually look at uh, pigments that are, have been gone missing? And this started uh, with a project looking at uh, uh, the writings of Archimedes. Um, so Archimedes, uh, early uh, 200 BC out of Syracuse, uh, he's probably most famous for jumping out of the bathtub yelling Eureka when he kind of had this idea of floating bodies and how to determine the mass of a floating body. Um, but also was very well known for his uh, theories and mathematics of developing, while well, he didn't in invent simple machines, he did a lot to understand them, how they worked better, both le uh, levers, pulleys, screws. Uh, very, uh, uh, one of the first uh, uh, philosophers that really talked about how to determine the value of pi. And did a lot with looking at the, both the surface area and volume of solid bodies. Um, and he actually you know, was a developer of almost a uh, base of uh, calculus uh, thousands of years before it really uh, was uh, shown by Newton and uh, uh, Leibniz. Um, so he wrote a lot of these uh, works out in pap papyrus scrolls back in those days, and later generations would take those scrolls and copy and recopy them to preserve that information. Uh, by about the fourth century, uh, we started moving from papyrus to parchment, uh, which is a, a goat skin paper. And then that was put in between wooden planks to help preserve it, so that's kind of the first, uh, first type of a book, essentially. 
Um, in the 13th century, as parchment got scarce, it was very common for these manuscripts that were often in religious institutions to be reused and recycled. Um, so they would scrape them, turn them around, cut the pages in half, try to wipe them down as much as possible, and rewrite over them. And that's the uh, palimpsest, which means uh, scraped again. Um, and so you can see here, this is um, um, this particular palimpsest that was uh, a lo some lost work of Ar Archimedes was found in Constanti Constantinople in the Hagia Sophia around uh, 1907, on, in July there. And it finally made its way to uh, Slack in 2006, so about 99 years later, it made it there for uh, looking at x-ray imaging. Um, it contains, uh, what, seven uh, books, or, or I would say uh, um, small works of his, uh, four which have been uh, previously known very well. Uh, the fifth one on floating bodies had never been seen in, in its original Greek, only in translated from Greek. And the last two, the uh, method of mechanical theorems and the uh, stomachon had never been um, seen before. Um, this is an interesting one because it's a very different writing of his. It, it's uh, basically a bunch of brain teasers, but the translation for brain teasers was bellyache, bellyache in those days, so it was a little bit different. And uh, several of the pages, in addition, had very challenging uh, problems that presented themselves. So in its history through time, um, various people wanted to make it look more expensive than it really was. So there was some, of course, illuminated manuscripts in those, in those pages. <coughs> but they added some extra gold leaf that was put on much later and did lots of uh, painting on there to make it look more fancy and more expensive. And it just made it, makes it harder to read in the end. Um, this is why, though, this uh, manuscript had to come to a synchrotron, though, because in order to see the writing underneath that, we really needed a more powerful tool. Um, and this is one of the first uh, data sets that came out. And uh, interestingly enough, this actually, uh, the bottom here is, if you translate this, is, uh, actually shows you the scribe in uh, the original Greek that uh, did the, trans the translation. Um, so so now, we, now we know at least who was the one that tried to save and preserve this work. Um, the scholars are very excited about uh, knowing that. Um, but it also has uh, various, um, various important parts here. So a lot of these could be read by um, uh, visible means. So the person who first had the uh, palimpsest set uh, basically took a magnifying glass and tried to read all of the uh, ancient words as much as he could, and he, he made a rough translation. Um, but a, a lot of what we were able to do is really clarify a lot of those works that we either couldn't be seen before or um, needed the extra x-ray. So this bottom corner, we can make out extra, extra characters here by the tops of these letters here. And the fact that this particular theorem ends in this uh, chi word, according to the uh, um, um, scholars, basically then retranslates that sentence and it means that he actually has more of an actual concept of infinity than uh, previously thought. So this goes back to then his theorems of um, uh, volume and surface area to actually, that he actually was doing a, a more calculus type addition of layers rather than just uh, summing up uh, shapes. Um, this has uh, moved on to this year to looking at another uh, uh, palimpsest. Uh, this is uh, one that's done by uh, Galen, who was a uh, Roman um, uh, doctor, uh, a Greek doctor in Roman times. Um, again, same kind of idea. He had, his writings were very important because it was kind of the state of art of the art of medicine in the Roman Empire. And it was translated into Syriac and then spread into the Middle East. So this is uh, one of the ways of which medicine, at least from the Roman and Greeks, were spread into, uh, throughout the world, into, and particularly into the Middle East regions. Um, it was overwritten in the, in the 11th century, again, as a prayer book. And the uh, um, monks that did this one did a really good job of erasing. So the Archimedes one, you could actually see it quite a bit just by light techniques. Uh, much of this was much more difficult to read. Um, so it was uh, a true challenge. And again, uh, so really a collaboration here between both the owner and the private collection, the scholars who wanted to be able to translate this, uh, the librarians, the book conservators, and uh, us at the Singatron here. So we had to unbind the book, place it in a custom holder here to be able to place it and make measurements. And here it is in the beam line, individual pages. Um, and that's one of our very first uh, uh, results. Um, so you can see the um, Syriac that's being uh, uh, kind of written vertically in this case here, and the old Syriac is written below is the actual writings of Galen. Uh, 
Um, this required a much more uh, sophisticated process. To, to we couldn't just look at the elements present. We had to do a complex uh, machine learning technique to try to pull these uh, parts out. But with enough training, um, these, these words come out quite clearly. Uh, the scholars, scholars were, very, were very excited right away. And there is a conference uh, exploring the Galen Palmacest uh, this fall uh, at the British Academy um, being held in Manchester. And uh, there's a whole uh, session about the work that we did with the synchrotron and how that's enabled the scholars to uh, retranslate a lot of this uh, material. Um, so now we're going to keep on working with other pigments. So we've gone from ones that were uh, erased, and now we're going to go to ones that are uh, overpainted and hidden. Um, this is a, a case of um, um, a sample that came from uh, the Fine Arts <laughs> Museum in San Francisco. And they have this uh, picture on the right here. It's a, um, was, was thought originally to be a Medigliani. Um, and it's oil on hardboard uh, of uh, Baranowski. Um, and it, it supposedly has the same provenance as a known, uh, well-established provenance uh, material um, painting in a private collection. And when the people in San Francisco Museum were found this in their basement, it was attached with this note saying from a uh, previous uh, um, conservator saying, no, I'm pretty sure this is a fake. Um, this is why it's in the museum. Don't bother with it. Um, and so it actually gave us a perfect case to go like, oh, you know, when, you, when you talk to a curator and you say, can I x-ray your painting? They're like, huh, maybe not. Um, but if we often assure them, they said, oh, well, this is, this is an interesting case. This could be a Medigliani, but it's probably not. So go ahead and here, you can take this and do whatever you want with it. It's like, OK. Uh, but it gave us a great case to actually uh, um, um, play with this painting. Um, and if you actually overlay these two images together, you see that they are closely related. There's some different changes in the posing here. Um, so there's quite a bit that be, might, might be able to be initially thought that if it was real, it would have been maybe the rough sketch that he made for his final portrait. And he was experimenting with maybe pigments and colors and posing for this. Um, but so they allowed us to x-ray it. Uh, so here it is in the, in the beam line. Uh, they built a nice frame for it. Uh, we were particularly interested in the head region, so we had to mount it upside down. Um, but if we look at, uh, in particular now, this is uh, mercury, which is in the pigment vermilion, which is a nice red. You can see it's obviously in the uh, f uh, flesh tones of the face. But you see these uh, weird uh, swirls in the, in the back of the head there. And this is coming from a layer of paint that's below what we see uh, visually on the top. And it matches a lot of work that Medigliani did as both a sculptor and a sketch artist. So they, he had these kind of African designs and masks and paintings that he did. And so this is one of the first evidence that actually then begins to believe that he had some spare canvas, spare uh, hardboard in his lab or in his art in his studio. It had some previous drawings on it. He needed to make a sketch for his next art, next work, and did this rough sketch to the point now where uh, it has been re this this uh, sample has been reevaluated by the uh, experts in Medigliani, and it's now been attributed and raised up into the um, authenticity. And now, rather than being uh, stored in the basement of the Finance Museum, it's now in a nice frame hanging up on the wall. Um, now. That, that, that's pretty exciting and pretty fun. Um, but then we decided to look at this in more detail. So they were in the conservation process, they took some subsamples out. And we wanted to take a look at the chemistry. And we noticed here um, in the eyes, there was two different, uh, he used two different pigments here. So there's, this is looking at the arsenic. And one eye is, has a lot of arsenic, and one eye has very little arsenic. And you can see there's, very little, there's some very subtle shading differences in the eyes. And he d if you look at a lot of his work in the past, there is a lot of often subtle difference in the, uh, in the color of his eyes. Um, this is what the, the subsample looks like. If we now uh, look at this in X-ray fluorescence, we can see a map of, say, iron, which shows the ground layers below. And we see copper and arsenic. Uh, copper and arsenic make a very common uh, green pigment uh, called uh, Paris green, um, which is also very famous in other ways. Um, but the distributions of those uh, uh, two elements are very different, though, in a lot of ways. Um, so we wanted to go and look at the chemistry of like, what's happening in the different distri distributions of copper and arsenic. And if we look at arsenic, in the spectroscopy, we see a, a vast difference in the oxidation state. So it goes from arsenic 3 to arsenic 5. 
if we look at that a little bit closer and begin to look at multiple measurements, we see that a lot of those points are actually very labile in the beam. So as we're exposing it to the X-ray beams, it's being shifted from arsenic-3 to arsenic-5. Um, and so this is then a, a real important case of how this measurement can be, needs to be done very carefully. And even if, if, if we flash back to our dinosaur for a minute here, even when we're doing the spectroscopy on those uh, copper pigments in the uh, feathers, uh, you can see that as we repeat these scans over and over again, we see a shift in the ox oxidation state there as well. Um, so it's a very important here that even after, as we're taking many, many scans, we actually have to be very careful and by measuring multiple points to require multi-locational areas. Um, we had to actually had to go back to the curators in this place and say, I think we've uh, uh, reduced about uh, 10,000 atoms of copper in your, in your, in your fossil. And as long as he, we couldn't see it, the curator was fine. But we had to go back with that information that, you know, things have happened. Um, so can we actually do a technique that can we actually get all the information with to get both chemical and positional information uh, so by combining these two techniques? Um, so we, this is a spectroscopic imaging technique rather than just uh, single points. And we're basically doing selected energy spectroscopy, or a CXAS. And so we're going to measure the fluorescence of an element um, at several points through an absorption edge. This is showing arsenic and iron here. And we'll get different compositions, so different distri distributions as we go through that edge. And that will show us the different chemistries by uh, doing a, a, a fitting that does both energy variation and spatial variation in there. And we can take these exposures that are on the order of megagrays for a long-term spectroscopy and really reduce this down to about a kilogray. Uh, so we can really reduce that dose by uh, over a thousand times often. And then when we pull this together, we now see that um, in our uh, Medigliani section, we have copper uh, based here. And the part that actually matched the original pigment <coughs> um, matches the copper distribution quite well. And then we see the rest of that distribution is due to the oxidized arsenic that's occur occurred in the painting. And this also now shows a process where it's not just the beam that's done it, but now this arsenic being sitting in the painting and being exhibited and non-exhibited for a long time is beginning to spread and change. Um, so this is often common in both um, these green pigments as well as, as arsenic uh, sulfur compounds in a lot of the oranges and yellows in a lot of uh, places. So trying to understand these changes of arsenic sulfide pigments is very important and how that happens with what conditions. So that's leading to another uh, uh, avenue of investigation with this other class of arsenic pigments as well. Um, now I want to now that we've talked about a little bit about damage pigments, I want to finish off with uh, talking about how we can actually try to characterize this damage and maybe prevent future damage. Um, so the big question is when you take a painting to a synchrotron, does it really justify the science and the question justify the use of the synchrotron? Because um, there's lots of lab sources, we have our handheld uh, sources often, and a lot of uh, both uh, museums and um, x-ray uh, companies are making their own uh, single, single small scanners. And there's a lot of things that you can do with a lab scanner if you just want to look at x-ray composition. Um, but if you want to try to look at chemistry, that really does still justify the synchrotron. So that all, again, it all depends on um, what your question is about the object. Um, now, as we get uh, brighter and brighter with synchrotrons, um, I've been doing synchrotrons for, we'll say, a while. And we keep on trying to build a fancier, more brighter source and trying to focus things down to smaller and smaller beams to get information on. And as we do that, uh, the flux gets higher and higher and the flux density gets higher and higher. So in, compared to, say, a traditional spectroscopy experiment, um, even done currently with a, with a large beam, maybe we have 10 to the fifth photons in a square millimeter. And by the time we go down, go down to the newest generations of nanoprobes, we're talking about flux densities in the uh, 10 to the 12th photons per 10 to the 13 photons per square millimeter. And you can do a lot of, uh, you can put a lot of dose in that type of sample. Um, and particularly uh, when you're looking at, say, elements or samples that may absorb a lot of the photon dose, um, like, say, sulfur pigments and lapis, which we'll be talking about in a minute here, um, you can be putting almost eight megagrays of um, radiation into that surface sample. And I know I mentioned grays before. If you're not familiar with that unit, uh, your typical chest x-ray is about one milligray. About one or two grays is lethal. And this is eight megagrays. So it's quite a bit of, quite a bit of dose. Um, and so instead of you know, burning holes in things, uh, we need to think about uh, creative ways to do this. 
Um, so we're working on both ways to limit exposure and using techniques that maximize our information content um, while minimizing that exposure and develop better tools to actually be able to know when things are happening before it's, it's too late and you have a hole in your sample. And part of this last bit here is I've been actually trying to really implement uh, multimodal imaging. And this is actually an idea that came out of my, one of my first trips to Paris um, in one of these first discussions of uh, beam damage. Um, we thought about how we might be able to monitor, monitor this better. And with these collaborations that have come and, these, and trying to talk with different scientists about how we might be able to do this, we've developed this and now implemented it at SSRL. And I hope to make this maybe a standard um, implementation across several other beam lines where we can actually collect both visible light for a camera and visible light that can be split into a spectrophotometer and look at the uh, full spectrum at every single measurement that we make, whether it be mapping, uh, spectroscopy. Um, our first generation just had some old things I had recycled in the lab. Our new ones here can now even work into the uh, near-infrared regions. So we can kind of cover um, all flavors of photons from x-rays to visible to infrared, ideally. Um, and this shows our first, this is uh, um, our x-ray map, and this is the combined image of the visible map put together. It's not, it's not a photo, but it actually is the hyperspectral information from this um, spectrum put together. And you can see how you get the nice different colors of blue matching out the uh, concentration of sulfur in this particular pigment here, too. Um, so it actually does work very nicely. Um, and this leads into, uh, into blue, my, my, one of my favorite colors. Uh, ultramarine is a uh, uh, very particular famous pigment. It's been used uh, for quite some time. Back in the Renaissance period, it was worth its weight in gold, worth, worth more than gold, and thus was often reserved for you know, some of the most uh, um, pristine of subjects, so the Madonna, for instance. Um, more uh, other famous works, uh, when it c comes into uh, Dutch history, um, uh, Vermeer's uh, usage in common people was actually, I think, a maybe a commentary on uh, uh, social status at the time, too. Um, but it is a very commonly used pigment and uh, very, has a long, interesting history. Um, what made it so expensive was its ex extraction from the raw rock, uh, lapis lazuli. And so it had to be um, powdered, rock powdered, uh, put into a, a complex melt of wax and resins and gums, melted, turned into a crayon, they would knead this crayon for days and then dissolve it in a hot lye bath to extract the pigment. And you would get, uh, th you did this several times, each time you would get a purification process that occurred. The first time giving you the brightest blues and as you went into these second and third washes getting what was called the ashes, so these lower grades. Um, now lapis is a, um, as a, a rock has, is mostly con um, composed of lazulite, um, which is a sodium aluminum silicate that has a really interesting cage structure that contains this tri-sulfur radical compound, and that's what gives it, gives it its bright blue color. Um, and now remember, while we're doing this, so we initially did this experiment to try to see if we could look at the sulfur content as we went through these different uh, washes. Um, and that was interesting in itself, but what was really, really interesting was the effect of beam damage, because remember, at this energy, particularly in this compound that has lots of sulfur, we're putting in um, lots and lots of energy at these uh, measurements. So we soon noticed that we uh, uh, did see quite a bit of beam damage occurring. Um, on the left here, these are the spectra, um, going from the initial one in the lightest blue to the uh, final ones in the darkest blue. And we can see that this shoulder here increases, uh, this peak here increases, and these parts decrease a little bit. Um, if you look at the spectral features that correspond to this part of the spectra here, this is the trisulfur radical at 2469. Uh, 2471 represents sulfur that's hanging out as almost like a, um, a free sulfur without another sulfur bond, bond into it. And the parts that are decreasing on 2472 and 73 here are the disulfide bonds. So by this image here, as we begin to hit it with radiation, we have, have a loss of sulfur-sulfur uh, bonding creating more radicals and more dangling uh, sulfur bonds. Um, and if you even take a quick photo with your iPhone when it comes out of the beam line, you can see it's uh, this little center part here, this little round, uh, slightly darker blue part is darker blue. So it corresponds with the uh, bluing of the, of the data. 
of the sample. Now, if we take this as a whole, look at all the different grades, the pure rock by itself, microbeam and macrobeam, and plot that all together and begin to do some analysis on it, we can see that there's two kind of vectors of motion here. We have one where we have an increase of grade, where we're increasing the amount of the lapis, a lazulite, in the actual sample. So that's kind of this direction here. And we have a common direction coming from the upper left to the bottom right as being the first sample down to the last sample analyzed of it bluing, um, changing with beam and the uh, changing of the sulfur speciation. Um, so we can, we can actually monitor this reaction as a function of time in the beam. Um, each scan here was about 50 megagrays. And so we can actually now use this to make a kinetic curve. Um, so now this is dose in the horizontal axis. And this is basically essentially the distance along that principal component analysis in the Y. And it does a really nice job of fitting a uh, pseudo first order kinetics on uh, the same set of uh, parameters can be used to explain all the curves that we measured there. Um, so with only, only variable B here being the total amount of pigment that was originally in the different size beam as a function of purity or microbeam. And we can get, actually get some very useful numbers out of here. So it's um, kind of like instead of having a half life measurement, we have a half dose measurement where we would actually uh, have half the pigment under the beam having, having a, a reaction problem. And that's about 94 megagrays. And considering that our single scans were 50 megagrays, you can see that we, we are putting quite a bit of potential damage in the sample right away. This then allows us to say, we could decide what a threshold, for what, what uh, dose might want we want to be. So maybe only 10% of the pigment might change. That's seven megagrays potentially. And we can take, take a look at our measurements and see that if we did just a single image, uh, with a synchrotron, we'd be well below that. And even if we use that multiple energy approach that I talked about with the uh, Medigliani, we could be well under those thresholds. So these techniques of doing multiple energy uh, measurements at selected energies through the edge um, can really keep ourselves under these damage thresholds, which is important to do. Um, this is actually then now a process where we'll continue to look at different pigments under different conditions and try to uh, establish these dose damage relationships across uh, different compounds. Um, but of course, um, as a uh, um, uh, chemist and a physicist, I really want to understand what's actually happening here rather than just seeing those uh, bonds break. Um, and so I grabbed a, a bunch of synthetic ultramarines um, from the pigment stores. And of course, they don't do anything like the natural ones. It's just your uh, natural luck. Um, if I look at the natural ones, I, uh, natural ones I, here in the blue, I see a big change between the first and the last scans. The synthetic ones, hardly any difference here. Um, so part of that could be the intensity of the sulfur. These are now, cages are fully occupied where the natural ones are only partially occupied. Um, but there could be something else going on too. Um, and so I, we've now collect, gone through, um, because the different colors in ultramarine, you can get everything from pinks to greens to blues to purples, all have to do with the different types and ratios of the polysulfide radicals that are present in those cages. And so if we are thinking that maybe there's impurities or something else in the uh, uh, ultramarines, in the natural ones, we need to look at all the model compounds we might be able to pull apart to see which ones uh, uh, react differently. Um, so we have a, a big box of uh, model pigments and we've collected uh, upwards of almost uh, 3,000 spectra in different conditions across all these different compounds. And I think this, we haven't analyzed all this yet. Uh, it's a lot of spectra to go through, but hopefully this will give us a really good idea of which parts in the ultramarines are the labile species and try to understand what chemistry and what photochemistry is leading on to these types of reactions, particularly in this uh, single pigment. Um, I just want to finish off by uh, saying, uh, as Loic mentioned, uh, we've uh, done a lot of work with the IAEA and again, trying to bring together uh, scientists and curators, conservationists from uh, all over uh, both the world and all over different fields, to try to just think about uh, these different types of radiation effects and thinking about how we can actually begin to advise curators and scientists and other experimenters about the um, risk and uh, reward uh, relationships. As a result, uh, we're about to have our first uh, informational document being released by IAEA, hopefully soon, on the safe examin examination of heritage materials and trying to develop uh, an, uh, guidelines for good practices. Uh, so at least everyone's always thinking about this before they um, make their measurements, or at least begin to get everyone in the right frame of mind. <laughs>
And um, just in case you are interested in the cultural heritage field, I want to throw a little plug out for two uh, very exciting meetings that will talk about um, both radiation damage, um, I'm, I hope, I'm sure, I'm, at least one, one or two of these meetings, as well as uh, lots of other parts of heritage science. Uh, there's a Gordon Conference uh, next summer, uh, Scientific Methods in Cultural Heritage Research, and then the Sigatron Radiation uh, in Arts and Archaeology that will be co-hosted by uh, us at SSRL and the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. And uh, finally, I would be very remiss without acknowledging um, all the institutions that have supported me or my work in many of these cases here, um, all the people that back home that I work with, all the people that I've met and been working with here in, in Europe and the Paris area, and all the people um, from various institutions uh, throughout the U.S. and um, that have um, lent their support and efforts to a lot of the work that you've uh, seen today. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'll take any questions. So thank you very much, uh, Sam. We have time for uh, questions. And Sam also speaks French. We did not. <laughs> 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 so you can ask in French or, or in English. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a question about the last example you showed mm -hmm. when you were uh, comparing the synthetic and natural uh, pigments. I'm not sure I understood well what you what you meant and what was your uh, hypothesis about the, the reason of this uh, difference. So there's um, th that's a, th a good question. I'm not sure we have a great answer for it yet. Um, that's one of the things I, I'm really trying to uh, uh, work on while I'm here as well. Um, so in the natural um, uh, pigments, there's often a spread of uh, disulfide, trisulfide, uh, four sulfide, and more uh, polymers of the uh, radicals that gives it the different uh, colors from bright blue to a slightly reddish to a slightly greenish hue. Um, everything from yellow to green to blue. Um, and so there could be, so the question is, is there a particular moiety or a particular species of that that's more reactive to radiation damage than others? Um, or is there a question with the occupation? So like when we make the synthetic pigments, you see how dark and vibrant they are versus the natural ones are a little bit more, um, less saturated in terms of their blueness. And so is it a concentration, just that it's breaking apart but we can't see it because it's all the other full ones are dominating our spectrum? Um, is there a particular uh, phase that's more reactive? Is there another impurity that's actually the photocenter that's then reacting and doing something else? Um, and so the first uh, test now has been to take a whole series of well-boundary well bound conditioned uh, ultramarines to have all the different um, sulfur combinations to go through that and try to see which ones are, have different reactivities. And that's the, d the data set I have now to begin to process that out to see if there is a particular form of um, polysulfide that's reactive, or more or less. And then if not, we'll go into the uh, further stages to see which parts are <coughs> reacting. Um, I have a question with the same thing, also on so there is a big question about the heat there as well. So, and that's, I think, the, um, when they are doing the extraction in the hot lye bath, um, that actually is, p is potentially um, opening up, some, relaxing some of those cages, and maybe allowing more of the um, pigments, or more, more of the trisulfur parts to get into those cages to, save, to um, bind them up. Um, so the question might be then, are we seeing anything with heating of the sample as well? Um, that's always a good question because we say we're depositing this much dose into the sample. Um, there's bound to be some heating effects too. So is that opening up the cages to allow things to come out or, or react as well? Um, that's always one of the things that we always wonder the most about though is like, particularly on a, on a beam that's about a micron or two thick, how do we measure the temperature rise of that single grain or two to really characterize that better? I think we can make some um, estimates but I think uh, that's a, a really good uh, question to really begin to investigate too. That, that could be the next thing if the chemical species don't uh, work out. You made a point about 
about um, damage of x rays uh, exposures on some artifacts. Does it mean that in some museums or in some places, some artifacts are in danger, not knowing your new prescription about uh, possible damages? What's the feeling? Well, we, you know, we, I don't want to be alarmist. Um, but so if you also think about, you know, so typically in the museum, they're using a maybe a tube source or a tr traditional source. Um, so the brightness there in terms of the dose is much, much less. Um, so I might get worried if they're sitting there with their object and hitting the button a thousand times and over, over x-raying it. Um, but it, it does bring caution. Um, we treat these as completely harmless um, uh, measurements, um, but they're not necessarily. And so we just, it makes you want to be able to say, okay, we need to think about what energies, what doses are we putting in the sample before we um, proceed on a, on a long experimental campaign. So, if, if I may add just a very small thing, maybe you can comment about uh, what uh, has been developed in Amsterdam, this question of radiation damage passport. Yeah. Or, uh, and so that's the biggest thing too is, you know, when, we, when we're in um, the lab often, particularly making measurements, you grab something, you make a measurement, and you move on, and you, you maybe note the sample name. Um, but there's a question of, like, you know, so we, have, we have long histories in terms of what's been done conservationally to a painting often, but not always what's been done measurement-wise. And so the other uh, working group in the IAE here is actually trying to make a standard radiation passport, essentially, or a measurement passport, so a, a, a well-described log of what measurements have done with what types of ionizing or even photon radiation to be kept in there. Because, you know, we see that, okay, you know, some damage I see instantaneously in a very spontaneous way. Um, but what happens in 30 years? Um, is there no effect or does, is, is there a, a longer, more sinister effect that happens 20 years later? And so if we have good um, record keeping of this, we can then at least know, oh, okay. We need to watch these spots and keep this for, for, ne for next treatments. Maybe just a naive question about uh, those. W when you talk about doses, do, do you talk about the uh, um, time which is involved in it? Because you can have a lot of energy in a very small amount of time, or you can actually you know, accumulate those, that's what you mentioned, pressing one yeah. times the project. You actually you can crap up the uh, dose you're putting into as much as a right. So there, those are both uh, good questions. So we have, uh, you can think about the instantaneous dose that's applied so in, a, in a single measurement. Um, but what's the relaxation between one measurement and the next? Is there an effect where it might recover and then it not, it's not as bad next time? Um, or if you're hitting it repeatedly, does that, how, how much does that dose add up time after time after time? Um, and I think that's a big unknown. And that's, I think, a lot of the things that, uh, a lot of the questions we actually want to be able to answer is what types of doses are, have the most potential for damage or and what types of doses are, are best in terms of safety. And hopefully, we, you know, I would think that you, know, you want, always want to keep your total <coughs> dose down to be the, the most conservative. But if you have an opinion on that, let me know. Yeah, no, what is also very important is to look at realistic heterogeneous compounds because uh, we, we know a lot about uh, mechanisms in uh, quite pure systems, but when we start looking at our very heterogeneous compounds, we don't know if uh, uh, to which extent the behavior is going to be modified by the fact that we have impurities, that the fact that we have structures that are not, uh, that, that are not ideal. And this is where uh, it's interesting to compare model systems uh, and, uh, and real systems working on heritage. Because in some cases we can find as uh, Sam was showing as well, that some of these systems which are very uh, old, very aged, they are quite uh, resistant to irradiation, so they would not change speciation easily, for instance, and this is quite interesting to understand why. Um. It's much harder to make a model system that's uh, 300 years old. Une dernière question, ou deux? Thank you all. <laughs>